Grace and peace be with you. Hi, my name is Mark. I'm the pastor of Sycamore Creek Church in Potterville. Thank you for joining us today for our online worship service. We are we're getting close to Christmas, and today we're continuing in our series, Missing Peace, that is helping us to prepare for Christmas. As, as we do that, we're going to be talking about waiting today. And I have a chat question for us as we get started today in worship, and that's, uh, what is a setting or a place where you find it most difficult to wait? Boy, I get, I, I'm finding that these questions this month, I could go with lots, lots of different places where I am impatient. Um, one of the places I am definitely very impatient is when I am in line at the grocery store. Um, you know, I've got in my mind that I want to get going. I've gotten everything on my list and I'm, I'm ready to leave and I have to wait to pay for my items. And that can be a line at the self-checkout. That can be a line where I'm waiting for someone to check me out. It doesn't matter. I have a hard time waiting. <laughs> In those instances. How about you? What's the time? You know, maybe it's getting a table at a restaurant or whatever it might be. Where do you have a hard time waiting? As we contemplate that, we're going to turn to God and singing. I invite you to join Kevin in this first song. As we continue Advent today, this season of preparing to celebrate Jesus' birth, we are reminded that when God's people were surrounded by hardship, they were suffering, there was grief, Isaiah proclaimed to them, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. We come today to online worship as a people who are also surrounded by suffering and grief. Yet the Spirit hovers among us, tending and anointing, inspiring freedom where there is captivity, declaring blessing in places the world is cursed, and igniting fierce joy where mourning and heartache prevail. We wait today as people who experience hardship and pain, and yet we're called to witness to the persistent joy that sustains our life as God's people. 
Now, as I light the first, second, and third Advent candles here in Potterville, I invite you to light a candle at home. If, if you have an Advent wreath with candles, that's great, you can use that, but most of us don't have that. So light whatever candle that you do have. We light these candles today as signs of our shocking hope, our just peace, and fierce joy. May our lives shine with the fierce, tenacious joy of the light who lives in our hearts as we wait and work for the coming of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Light your candle at home as I light mine here in Potterville. We look to the light of that pink candle as we look to God and the joy that God brings to our lives. Will you join me in prayer? God, I thank you today for joy. And I pray that as, as we talk today about peace and, and about waiting and about finding peace in the midst of waiting, that we might also encounter you and your joy. God, whatever circumstances we are in the midst of right now, whatever things we are waiting for, Pray that we might find your peace and that we might find your joy. Now God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us and help us to not just take those gifts for ourselves, but to share your joy with others, uh, to recognize you as a source of joy, a joy that is to be shared with the world around us that needs joy. We pray all this in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to continue praying with me as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Will you please join me? With that prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today we are continuing in our series, Missing Peace. We have Pastor Tom with us from our Eastwood campus. He's also the lead pastor of Sycamore Creek. And he's going to be talking about how do we find peace in the midst of waiting. But first, here is our host for today. Hi, my name is Kathy Doby, and I'm your host today. Welcome to Sycamore Creek Church in Potterville. We're glad you've joined us for worship. I invite you to get connected to Sycamore Creek Church and take the next steps to help you along your faith journey by submitting your prayer request. You do all those things by filling out a digital connection card at sycamorecreekchurch.org slash connection. Take a moment to do that. We refer to that connection card again later in the worship service. Connect with us for the first time and we'll send you a free book. We hope today's worship will be impactful and meaningful. If today's worship is helpful, take a moment and share it with your friends on social media. You can share the worship service and use our hashtag, hashtag SCC Potterville. Today's message begins with this. Joseph considered divorcing Mary quietly. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet, Look, the virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. One of the worst feelings in life 
is to wait. Especially when you have to wait on God. When you feel like God's taking too long. When God has forgotten you or isn't paying attention or maybe sleeping or does God go to the bathroom, close the door, (laughs) pretend you're not there? Maybe you have migraines or a loved one you really want to come to church or to come to faith. Or maybe you just want a job with benefits to cover the basics, the basic necessities in your life. Or you're waiting for the healing of a hurting relationship. Or waiting for depression to subside. Or maybe you don't have a spouse or life partner and you're looking for one. Maybe you wonder, when will racism be eradicated from the human population? When will my family or my friends or my job or my faith community fully embrace and include the LGBTQ community? Or maybe you're waiting for war to end so there's peace. I found myself for the last 10 years waiting on my foot pain. Uh, Recently, I've been diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis, but before that, I had all kinds of diagnoses and three surgeries, countless podiatrists, hundreds of hours probably in physical therapy, and none of it resulted in any less foot pain. I've been waiting and waiting and waiting. Sometimes I've been waiting so long, and maybe you have too, that you wonder, does God even care? Is God even there? Well, as we begin this message, I want to know what's something you're waiting for. Let's turn to a neighbor and talk about that, or put it in the comments in the chat. Let's discuss. If you find yourself waiting, then you know exactly what the people in the Bible felt like. Because God promised a Messiah, a Savior, an anointed one, and the people waited, and they waited, and they waited, and then nothing. I want to show you just how long God's people waited. We got to go all the way back to the beginning, the book of Genesis, which literally in Hebrew means beginning. And it tells the story of Adam and Eve, of the creation of all of the earth and the universe and the two human beings, Adam and Eve. And we all know the basics of this story. Adam and Eve are told not to eat from the one tree. They could eat from anything else. But then this serpent shows up and tempts uh, Adam and Eve, and they both eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when they do, they end up being ashamed, and they end up being uh, aware of their wickedness and their nakedness, and they know right from wrong at that point, because before they didn't know wrong because they hadn't done any wrong. And God then shows up and says, listen, why are you running from me? Who told you you were naked? 
And eventually then God kind of explains, well, what's going to happen from this? Like, what are the natural consequences of it? And he talks first to Adam and then to Eve. And then God speaks to the serpent. And here's what God says. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Right here in the very third chapter of the first book of the Bible is what biblical scholars and theologians, both Jewish and Christian, have looked at and said, listen, this is, this is a unique moment. There's something that God is promising here that the things that are broken in this world and the cause of them, the serpent in this case, um, will be, well, taken out of the game. <laughs> will be struck by uh, the heel of the offspring of Adam and Eve. And then centuries pass, and more centuries, and more centuries, and millennium, and nothing happens. This Savior, this Messiah, this Christ, this Anointed One, well, never shows up. And then 700 years before Jesus' birth, which we're in the process of preparing to celebrate for, the prophet Isaiah gives this prophecy. It's both a prophecy about something that's going to happen immediately, the birth of a son in uh, King Hezekiah's family in the midst of this really terrible time. But people who read the Bible and study it look at it also as a prophecy of something that's going to happen in the future. It's going to have this bigger spiritual meaning. And here's what the prophet Isaiah says. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. God's people read this prophecy and they anticipate a Messiah, a Savior, and then they wait, and they wait, and they wait, and they wait, and nothing. Can you relate? Sometimes you got to wonder, what exactly is God doing while all of this waiting is happening? It, it feels to me, it reminds me of those tricks that people will train their dog to do, where they'll put like some food on their nose, and they'll make the dog wait, and wait, and wait, and then they say eat, and the dog throws it up and gobbles it up. Except in this case, <laughs> is God just putting broccoli on our nose and just waiting, and waiting, and waiting, and waiting? There's a period of history of waiting that's not in the Bible. It's actually referred to as the intertestamental period. Do you see that testament? There's the Old Testament and the New Testament and the inter testament the time between these two witnesses of god's work and god's uh plan and god's people in the world and it's not in our bible at least it's not in protestant christians bibles in the catholic bible there's this extra section called the apocrypha which has several books in it like tobith and judith there's some extra parts of the book of daniel and the book of first and second maccabees in the book of Maccabees, we get thrown into the history of this intertestamental period where the wake of Alexander the Great's conquest of the Mediterranean, he conquested in 12 years more than anyone else in that region of the world had ever conquested. And then the rise of the Greek Empire, the Seleucid Empire, and then the Jewish revolt through the rise of the Maccabean family, and then ultimately them losing their independence when Rome shows up, and the Roman Empire is unlike anything else that the world has ever seen before, and it just crushes Israel once again. The Israelites or the Jewish people got a taste of what they wanted, which was a political leader in the Maccabean revolt, but it ended up not being as long-lasting as they would have hoped for. It's in this period, though, where the Maccabean Revolt is successful that you have the birth of the celebration of Hanukkah and the rededication of the temple in Jerusalem. All of this, though, is eventually quashed completely by the Romans. And we see the people waiting and waiting and waiting. Is God silent? Is God there? What about this Messiah? What about this anointed one? What about this Christ? 
Sometimes it feels like we get no answer from God. We, we say to God, it was like this bargaining thing that we do with God. We're like, God, just give me a sign. Give me a word. Like, just make that leaf fall from the tree and I will know that you're there. And instead, all we get is silence. It reminds me of the great defender of the Christian faith, C.S. Lewis, who would stand before hundreds of people and intellectually defend the Christian faith. But when his wife died, his grief overwhelmed him. And he wondered in a book that he wrote anonymously called A Grief Observed, if God wasn't behind a locked door, while C.S. Lewis was pounding on that door, asking, God, are you there? Why this suffering? Why this grief? All right, I've dug us in a pretty deep hole here, haven't I? Uh, But here's the good news I want you to hear today. Just because God is silent does not mean that God is absent. While you are waiting, God is working. And we get from the Apostle Paul, he's one of the first missionaries of the church, wrote lots of letters to the churches that he founded around the Mediterranean that ended up in our book, uh, our New Testament of the Bible. And we get in one of his letters a little bit of, I think, a behind-the-scenes peek at what God is doing in the waiting. Uh, Let's hear what Paul has to say. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. This phrase, in the right time, in Greek is pleroma chronu, which means like in completeness, in perfect time, in the fullness of time. You can think of this literally like a ship being filled up and all of the cargo needs to be loaded first, the crew needs to be put on first, um, the anchor needs to be brought up, and when the time is right, the ship sets sail. A couple of different translations put it this way. But when the time was right, but when the fullness of time had come. I think you could artistically say, particularly as we're talking about the birth of Jesus, when the time was fully pregnant. The baby was ready to come. And you've seen people pregnant, you've seen women pregnant, and there's a moment when the baby is not ready to come, the time is not fully pregnant. And then there's the time, and every woman who's ever been pregnant knows, get this baby out. (laughs) The time is right. It's full. It's pregnant. It's ready to go. Here's a question for you to chat with a neighbor or put your answer in the comments. When was a time when everything was just right that you've experienced? Let's talk about that. When the right time came, but when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman. Here I think Paul is echoing back to that third chapter in Genesis, 
when God says to the serpent, listen, your offspring, your children will strike the head of the serpent. And I find St. Anselm's uh, discussion of this really interesting. Here we're getting into like the Christian belief that Jesus was born of a virgin. St. Anselm was the Archbishop of Canterbury in the 11th century. And he said it was fitting of God for Jesus to be born just of a woman and not including a man because God had already created with the other two options. God created a human from no humans. That was Adam who was created from the dust. And God created a human from just a man. That was Eve who was taken from Adam's side, as Genesis tells us. And here we see in the New Testament, the birth of Jesus, a human being being created from just a woman. Do you, do you see the cycle there? The Anselm. So I, I think that's poetic. I think it's beautiful. I think it's an interesting way of thinking about why God did this. Um, and it also, for me, opens up some space in the Christian tradition for families that look a little bit different. If God could create from just a man or from no one or just a woman, then there's nothing like half or wrong about different makeups of families with two dads or two moms or a single mom or a single dad. There's enough there for a complete family to be created from. Now, when we start talking about the virgin birth, we get into some ancient biology that we now know is wrong. You see, the ancients thought that the man contributed a seed to the woman and her womb was basically like a garden that just fertilized and nurtured the seed until it grew. They didn't know that the woman contributed as well and particularly didn't have the whole understanding of genetics that we have today that you need two to tango, you need an X chromosome and you need a Y chromosome. This was an ancient way of saying basically this is how in Jesus God sidestepped uh, the thorny issue of how sin was transferred from person to person because since the Father was the Heavenly Father, uh, the sin didn't get transferred through the mother, and Jesus was therefore perfect. Now, we, of course, have all kinds of questions about that today, but I do still think that the idea of Jesus or the belief that there's something entirely unique about Jesus and his perfection and his sinlessness and his perfect love is still really important. And Christians have over the centuries come up with all kinds of different theories about why Jesus' perfection was important for our atonement, that is our being made at one with God. And there's three big theories. And most Christians, if you've grown up in America, have only heard of the first of those. The first one is substitutionary atonement. That Jesus, in his perfection, was the perfect substitute for your guilt. And your guilt is forgiven in Jesus' perfect self-sacrifice. That's the first theory of why Jesus' perfection is important. The second theory is called Christ the Victor, or if you like the Latin, Christus Victor. And in this theory, Jesus' perfection was important because his perfection allowed him to overcome the forces of evil in this world. Jesus died because he was like a soldier who went behind enemy lines to set you free from the bondage of sin and death. And only one who was perfect could do that. Now, the third theory of atonement and why Jesus' perfection was important, I didn't learn until seminary. It's a theory that's called theosis or divinization. And this is generally held more in the Eastern Christian tradition, Eastern Orthodoxy. And this idea says that Jesus' perfection was important because Jesus, in his perfect love, in his perfect divine nature, took on the human nature and in the process healed and absorbed all of the rottenness, all the brokenness, all of the sin that exists in humanity. 
and only a perfect human being could do that. Maybe you've heard the old adage that one rotten apple spoils the bunch, but what if you have a basket full of rotten apples and one apple that is fully God in its perfection and fully apple gets thrown into that bunch, what does it do? Well, it absorbs all the rottenness of all the other apples and heals it. Whatever is the right theory, and I don't know that any one theory by itself fully encapsulates what Jesus' perfection and Jesus' perfect love means or why it's important, but I think in all three of them together, we get a level of complexity and a level of beauty that, that we're getting at here when we talk about the virgin birth, of why Jesus was perfect in his love. When the time was right, he was born of a woman, and in it we became adopted as children of God. When I hear this adopted language, I think of the routine that we have in the morning with the boys, and we've had a couple of kids here from this campus as well come and hang out at our house in the morning before they go to school at Post Oak Academy across the street. And before they leave, uh, we have this little set of questions that I ask them and I say, remember who you are. And the right answer is, I'm a beloved child of God. And then I ask them, and who is everybody else? And the right answer is, beloved children of God. And then I say, and now you have to treat them like it, even if they don't act like it. We are all adopted, beloved children of God, every single one of us. No matter where you've been, what you've done, who you are, who you're not, you are a beloved child of God. So centuries passed and millennium passed and God's promised Savior finally came. Why that time? What was behind? Like if you could sort of peek behind the curtain of God's well view of the world, God's view of well, all of humanity, why was the time perfect? Why was it the right time? Why was the time pregnant at the time that Jesus was born? Now, the actual answer to that is, I don't know. I'm not God. It's above my pay grade. But maybe we can use our imaginations and creativity. I mean, Christians have been doing this for a long time, kind of reading in between the lines. And what we'll find when we read in between the lines is, just because God feels silent doesn't mean God is absent. And while we're waiting, God is working. You remember how I told you about that intertestamental period, the 400 years between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament? Well, historians and Christians, Christian theologians and biblical scholars have looked at that 400 year period and said, what's, what's particularly unique in all of history that's happening at that moment when Jesus is born? And let me give you four things that I think are really unique from that, well, that study or that kind of imaginative work. The first is that Alexander Great had, well, conquered the entire Mediterranean area and created this sort of, well, unified, shared culture around the whole Mediterranean Sea. This ultimately led to what historians call the Pax Romana or the Roman peace. This was sort of a unique period in history when across that whole region, there was a common culture, a, a set of roads that could be traveled on, a, a shared language. Almost everyone in the Roman Empire spoke a little bit, at least a little bit, of Greek. In the midst of this time period, Jews were no longer allowed to live in Jerusalem and they were dispelled out throughout the entire empire, what you would call the Jewish diaspora. And they set up different religious communities in all of the major cities and metropolitan areas around the entire Roman Empire. And the Old Testament was then translated for the first time into Greek. It's called the Septuagint. Everyone in the entire Roman Empire then could read about the story of God's work with God's people for the first time because of this shared language. So what you end up with are these religious communities that Paul and other missionaries went to where 
Jews are already there. They've already been reading the Old Testament in Greek, and Paul preaches to them, and many of them then come to see Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the long-awaited Christ, the Anointed One. And it spreads then throughout the whole Roman Empire from these Jewish centers out to Gentiles. Now here's the irony of this whole thing. Because it's the Roman Empire that facilitates this dispersion of Christian belief, this dispersion of Christian experience across its roads, across its culture, across its language. And yet what it was dispersing across the entire empire was a radical view of Jesus, of a total acceptance, of a, of a, of a love that subverted the very empire that facilitated its dispersion. While well, God's people were waiting, God was working. Maybe you're in a holding pattern and you feel again like, what is God doing? Why am I having to wait? And I want you to know that just because God is silent or just because you are waiting on God doesn't mean that you have done something sinful. It doesn't mean that you are somehow spiritually immature. There are stories of God's people throughout the entire Bible of, of God's people waiting Abraham and Sarah, the mother and the father of the Israelite nation, waited for 25 years to have a son. They waited until their old age. Joseph, who's one of the very early long stories in the Old Testament, the, the Joseph that you maybe know the best from Joseph in the Technicolor Dreamcoat, he was thrown into prison and waited 13 long years years, 13 long years in prison, unjustly accused before he ultimately was raised up to the second highest power of leadership and authority in Egypt. He waited. There was a woman with menstrual hemorrhaging who, after spending all of her money on doctors over 13 long years, waited and finally approached Jesus just to touch the hem of his garment, and she was healed. There was a man who couldn't walk, who waited for 38 long years to encounter Jesus and be healed. None of these people waited because they were sinful or because they were spiritually immature. In fact, they're all raised up as spiritual giants in the Bible, in the testament of our sacred book. And yet they still waited and waited. If you find yourself waiting, you're in good company. You're in good company with almost every story of any person in the Bible. It's been said that God's delays are not necessarily God's denials. While you are waiting, God is working. I mean, maybe one of the reasons that you're waiting is because whatever it is, whatever it is that you're waiting on, it's not ready yet. Or maybe whatever you are waiting on is because you aren't ready yet. I wonder if at times, if before God can do something for you, God has to do something in you. Has to build a kind of trust, a kind of dependence, a a, a sort of... Well, abandonment to God's love and God's way in this world. Don't waste the waiting. Don't waste the waiting. First, that prophet Isaiah says, For since the world began, no ear has heard and no eye has seen a God like you who works for those who wait for God. So what we're talking about here is how do you wait well? How do you wait in a way that is a mature waiting. Let's take a minute, let's talk about that. Put your answer in the comments or turn to the person next to you. What does it mean for you to wait well?
What does it mean to wait well? I'll give you one example from my life. And I don't know that I particularly waited well, but as I look back on how things progressed over the time, I can see a kind of, well, I can kind of catch a glimpse of how God was using the waiting or how the waiting could be used well by God. And you remember I told you about my foot pain. I've, in the last year or so, been diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis. It shows up mostly in my feet, but it's also in my hands and a lot of my joints. And um, I used to backpack all over the nation, I've, literally the nation. I've backpacked up in the UP, I've backpacked in all the lower peninsula, I've backpacked in the Adirondacks, I've backpacked in Canada, backpacked in the Smokies, in Yellowstone, in the Grand Tetons. I backpacked in Yosemite, I hiked in Italy. I mean, I love backpacking. I was, I was making like a life bucket list for all the places I could backpack. And the last time I went backpacking, I hiked maybe two, three miles at most with my son. And it was excruciating pain. I just couldn't do it anymore. And I realized instead of just sort of fighting with all this, and I'm not saying that going to see the doctors or the physical therapists or now have ended up with rheumatologists, uh, that anything about that was wrong. I think it was all good. But there's a sort of gentleness I've given to myself and I've adapted to the pain and shifted in things that I like to do. So instead of backpacking and camping out in the wilderness, now I enjoy canoe camping. And here's the crazy thing. As I started to canoe camp, it turns out that I enjoy canoe camping more than I enjoyed backpacking because the canoe does all the really hard work, especially when you canoe camp on rivers. I've adapted to instead of walking around the neighborhood, I now bike. And I definitely miss walking. I definitely miss um, backpacking, but I do enjoy biking as well. Uh, one of my pastime hobbies is also sailing. I love sailing and what do you do when you're sailing? Well, you sit in a sailboat. And what does all the work? The sail. My life is just as full as it always has been. Now, here's one other thing that I've noticed in myself is that this pain that I have has made me a more humble and compassionate person to other people's pain and hurt. Uh, there's a way that God has worked in the waiting to make me a better pastor because of it. I think back to Paul, St. Paul saying that he had this thorn in the flesh. And nobody really knows what that is, but I think most scholars think that it was a blindness that was coming on him. He was losing his sight. And Paul says, I asked God to take it away three times. And God responds back to him, says, no, I'm not going to do that, for my power is made perfect in weakness. There's a way that God's power through me in my being a pastor and being compassionate and loving of other people has been made more perfect through the waiting that I've had to do in the midst of my foot pain. One last thing I've noticed in that waiting is that I have grown to rely more on God rather than just on my own, well, natural abilities. Because sometimes my natural abilities, my physical, just literal, like natural physical abilities, well, they're just not enough anymore. I've had to wait, and God has been working in the waiting. I'd like to end with this thought. What if in the waiting... What if, well, we're not just pursuing God, but what if God is pursuing us? What if, uh, well, we're not just waiting on God, God is waiting on us. I think as I read the Bible and the story of Jesus and the stories that Jesus told in his teachings, that's what I see in God. A God that's not just passively waiting for you to respond, but a God that's actively searching you out actively preparing you for the next. This is what I think Peter, one of Jesus' closest followers, meant when he said something like this. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient 
for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Repentance just means, it's like an old traveling term. It's like you turn around. You're going the wrong way, so you got to turn around and go the other way. You have never traveled so far away from God that you can't just turn around and find that God is right there behind you. God is pursuing you even in your waiting. That's the good news today. Thank you, Tom. I have a few announcements for us. And the first announcement is that we would love to help you get connected with Sycamore Creek. We'd love to support you in taking steps where you can grow in your faith. And you can do all that and more by going to sycamorecreekchurch.org slash connection and filling out a digital connection card. I want to encourage you, take a moment right now to get connected to Sycamore Creek and help us to connect with you. If you do that for the first time, thank you. But we really appreciate that. And we'll send you a book by Max Lucado called You'll Get Through This right from Amazon directly to your house. We are in the midst of, of the week where we are preparing for Christmas. Uh, this morning at 1030, we have our kids Christmas program. Uh, we had our first showing of Come In from the Cold yesterday afternoon. We have another showing uh, today at 5 o'clock. We have Caroline around Potterville tonight at 7 o'clock. And then coming up this week, we have some great things that are happening the weekend of Christmas. We have on Saturday the 23rd, a spirited sanctuary service, uh, Sanctuary Spirits, where we will be uh, celebrating the birth of Jesus in a bar. And it's a great opportunity to invite someone to hear the Christmas story, to hear about the good news of Jesus, and to celebrate Christmas in a different setting uh, than in a church sanctuary. Now, if a church sanctuary is your thing, don't worry, we have plenty of options. We have a Sunday morning, uh, final Sunday in Advent service on the 24th. And then that evening, we will be uh, gathering at 7 p.m. for a candlelight Christmas service. I love that service. It's one of the highlights of the year for me. Lots of different ways where you can celebrate Christmas uh, coming up with Sycamore Creek. Speaking of Christmas, I want to remind you that throughout the month of December, we are highlighting our Christmas offering. Our annual Christmas offering you can give to anytime. And in particular, if you go to one of our Christmas services, like the service at Sanctuary Spirits or our candlelight service on Christmas Eve night, 100% of our offering goes to our Christmas offering. Now, the Christmas offering, it goes to three things. It goes to our care ministries, it goes to local mission, and it goes to global mission. And I could tell you stories all day long about the, the things that we do with that money that help us care for people in our community, like helping them with rent assistance and utility assistance, uh, the things that we do to reach out and share God's love with our community uh, through local mission. Things like our back to school bash that supports our schools and things like our gas giveaway and our free car washes. All, all of that comes from the Christmas offering. And then also our global mission where we support Dr. Meir and her feeding program through the Christmas offering, as well as supporting the United Methodist Church missions that are taking place throughout the world. All that happens through the Christmas offering. And a reminder, our, our Christmas offering comes with a challenge. And the challenge is to give away as much as you spend on Christmas. To give away as much as you spend on Christmas. It's a, a tangible reminder to each of us that Christmas just isn't about us and it being our birthday. It's about Jesus' birthday. It's about helping people serving people as Jesus has served us by becoming a human. That, that's what we celebrate at Christmas, Jesus' birth, uh, Jesus in the flesh, God in the flesh. The Christmas offering is one way that we can live that out. I want to thank you for your giving to Sycamore Creek. Thank you for your giving to the Christmas offering. Uh, and uh, we have a, a someone from Sycamore Creek who is going to share with us their reflections on the Christmas offering and what the Christmas offering means to them. Let's listen to what they have to say. I'm Jack Tingle. I am a member of Sycamore Creek Eastwood, uh, having been adopted by that church as, as a member of Asbury. When I retired, my wife Shirley and I both decided we didn't want to just be retirees uh, sitting around, so we became volunteers in an, an organization called the Nomads. Uh, the acronym is Nice Old Methodist Avoiding Deep Snow, that are a group of volunteers that have RVs 
that travel around the country volunteering, doing different types of service projects. For 16 years, we went around volunteering and then got to the stage of life where it wasn't easy to physically do that. And so we quit doing that and volunteered in the local church. When Sycamore Creek adopted Asbury, was the first time you had heard about the Christmas offering challenge to yes. give away as much as you spent at Christmas. Yes. Yes. What was your first thought when you heard about that challenge? I initially thought that that's very interesting. Uh, and I felt like it was a very good way to, to uh, support the church and give in a way that it could be used for the, the, the good of all. I love mission work and I feel like it's very important for local churches to be in mission and to do that locally as well as globally. The way the love of Christ is spread is through people loving each other and helping. And that's my personal belief is that it's best to do all you can, to as many as you can, wherever you can. Thank you again for your giving to the Christmas offering. I'm so grateful for your support and for all that we're going to be able to do in 2024. Here's Kevin with our final worship song. I am 
Thank you for joining us today as we talked about missing peace. I hope that you experience some of the peace of God in your life through worship today and that that continues throughout the rest of this week. We'll see you again soon. Thank you.